The Door Lectures on Mental Science by Thomas Troward. Lecture 1. Entering to the Spirit of It. Part 1 of 2. We all know the meaning of this phrase in our everyday life. The spirit is that which gives life and movement to anything, in fact it is that which causes it to exist at all. The thought of the author, the impression of the painter, the feeling of the musician, is that without which their works could never have come into being, and so it is only as we enter into the idea which gives rise to the work, that we can derive all the enjoyment and benefit from it which it is able to bestow. If we cannot enter into the spirit of it, the book, the picture, the music, are meaningless to us, to appreciate them we must share the mental attitude of their creator. This is a universal principle, if we do not enter into the spirit of a thing, it is dead so far as we are concerned, but if we do enter into it we reproduce in ourselves the same quality of life which called that thing into existence. Now if this is a general principle, why can we not carry it to a higher range of things? Why not to the highest point of all? May we not enter into the originating spirit of life itself, and so reproduce it in ourselves as a perennial spring of livingness? This, surely, is a question worthy of our careful consideration. The spirit of a thing is that which is the source of its inherent movement, and therefore the question before us is, what is the nature of the primal moving power, which is at the back of the endless array of life which we see around us, our own life included? Science gives us ample ground for saying that it is not material, for science has now, at least theoretically, reduced all material things to a primary ether, universally distributed, whose innumerable particles are in absolute equilibrium, whence it follows on mathematical grounds alone that the initial movement which began to concentrate the world and all material substances out of the particles of the dispersed ether, could not have originated in the particles themselves. Thus by a necessary deduction from the conclusions of physical science, we are compelled to realize the presence of some immaterial power capable of separating off certain specific areas for the display of cosmic activity, and then building up a material universe with all its inhabitants by an orderly sequence of evolution, in which each stage lays the foundation for the development of the stage, which is to follow, in a word we find ourselves brought face to face with a power which exhibits on a stupendous scale, the faculties of selection and adaptation of means to to ends, and thus distributes energy and life in accordance with a recognizable scheme of cosmic progression. It is therefore not only life, but also intelligence, and life guided by intelligence becomes volition. It is this primary originating power which we mean when we speak of the spirit, and it is into this spirit of the whole universe that we must enter if we would reproduce it as a spring of original life in ourselves. Now in the case of the productions of artistic genius we know that we must enter into the movement of the creative mind of the artist, before we can realize the principle which gives rise to his work. We must learn to partake of the feeling, to find expression for which is the motive of his creative activity. May we not apply the same principle to the greater creative mind with which we are seeking to deal? There is something in the work of the artist which is akin to that of original creation. His work, literary, musical, or graphic is original creation on a miniature scale, and in this it differs from that of the engineer, which is constructive, or that of the scientist which is analytical, for the artist in a sense creates something out of nothing, and therefore starts from the standpoint of simple feeling, and not from that of a pre-existing necessity. This, by the hypothesis of the case, is true also of the parent mind, for at the stage where the initial movement of creation takes place, there are no existing conditions to compel action in one direction more than another. Consequently the direction taken by the creative impulse is not dictated by outward circumstances, and the primary movement must therefore be entirely due to the action of the original mind upon itself, it is the reaching out of this mind for realization of all that it feels itself to be. The creative process thus in the first instance is purely a matter of feeling, exactly what we speak of as motif in a work of art. Now it is this original feeling that we need to enter into, because it is the fons et origo of the whole chain of causation which subsequently follows. What then can this original feeling of the spirit be? Since the spirit is life in itself, its feeling can only be for the fuller expression of life, any other sort of feeling would be self-destructive and is therefore inconceivable. Then the full expression of life implies happiness, and happiness implies harmony, and harmony implies order, and order implies proportion, and proportion implies beauty, so that in recognizing the inherent tendency of the spirit towards the production of life, we can recognize a similar inherent tendency to the production of these other qualities also, and since the desire to bestow the greater fullness of joyous life can only be described as love, we can sum up the whole of the feeling which is the original moving impulse in the spirit as love and beauty, the spirit finding 
expression through forms of beauty in centers of life, in harmonious reciprocal relation to itself. This is a generalized statement of the broad principle by which spirit expands from the innermost to the outermost, in accordance with a law of tendency inherent in itself. It sees itself, as it were, reflected in various centers of life and energy, each with its appropriate form, but in the first instance these reflections can have no existence except within the originating mind. They have their first beginning as mental images, so that in addition to the powers of intelligence and selection, we must also realize that of imagination as belonging to the divine mind, and we must picture these powers as working from the initial motive of love and beauty. Lecture 1. Entering to the Spirit of It. End of Part 1 of 2. Need help understanding Troward's teachings? The Thomas Troward lectures contain very deep and powerful information. But to get the most out of them, require repeated listening and in-depth study. Troward had only one personal student, Genevieve Berend, and her book Your Invisible Power distills the essence of Troward's lectures in a concise and easy-to-understand format. For many, this is a much-preferred way to learn Troward's teachings. Click the link below this video to visit yourinvisiblepower.us and learn more about Genevieve Berend's recently updated book. Click the link in the description below for a chance to win 10 classic best-selling Law of Attraction books, 